Hello Earth Science and welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be exploring uh, chapter 13, which is the topic of surface water. We're going to be talking about what surface water is, uh, what it does, how it affects the, you know, the landscape of Earth, the hydrology, the geography, uh, the geology of all of it. And so this is kind of water that's at the surface. And let's jump right into it. Let's ask the question, what is surface water? Uh, so surface water is any of this water that's running on the top of the surface. We're going to talk about groundwater coming up in the next chapter, which is exclusively uh, water that's inside of the ground. And there's a little, there's a little bit of uh, interplay between the two because sometimes this surface water is going to soak into the ground and sometimes that groundwater is going to come up to the surface. So let's start out and get some vocabulary in here. Uh, tributary, this is a stream that is running into a larger stream. So these are like the creeks or creeks, uh, depending on which part of the, the country you're in, flowing into the rivers, which are flowing into bigger rivers, which are then flowing into lakes. This running water is uh, really good at carrying sediment. And this sediment is able to erode rock. It creates those really smooth uh, river stones that you can find inside of streams. As these uh, tributaries go into larger rivers, they're going to carry the sediment down towards uh, the river, down towards the lake. Then from there, they're going to continue going until they reach the ocean. And a river and all of its tributaries are called a river system. So some parts of the river system, uh, the drainage basin or a watershed, this includes all the land that is draining into the rivers, including its tributaries. So this is all of the mountainous kind of structures, all of the uh, areas that aren't the river that that water is flowing over to get into the river. Uh, this brings us to the point of a divide, like if we have a mountain range, usually the water on one side of the mountain range is flowing into one drainage basin and the other side is flowing into a unique different drainage basin. Uh, there's a really big divide in the United States that we call the Continental Divide. It's the major one in the United States. Uh, it's in the Rocky Mountains on the, the western side. And any water that hits the western slopes of the Rocky Mountains is going to flow down until it reaches the Pacific Ocean. And any water that hits the eastern side of the Rocky Mountains is going to flow until it hits the Atlantic. This is uh, Mr. Greer here at the Continental Divide. This was taken a couple years ago. Uh, Mr. Greer's over here. This is Mama and Papa Greer. Uh, this, this part of the Continental Divide was in uh, Yellowstone. We crossed the Continental Divide several times in Yellowstone. So any snow behind me in this picture is going down to the Atlantic and any snow on this side of, of me is going down to the Pacific. So that's a really cool, really cool kind of a picture there. We think of this Continental Divide as this really jagged mountainscape when it's just another spot on the, on the map. All right, so some characteristics of streams and rivers. The ability of these streams and rivers to carry sediments and therefore erode things is affected by many factors, factors such as velocity and gradient and discharge and channel. And we're going to talk about each of these a little deeper and get a kind of a better grasp of what this means. So we'll start off with velocity. And velocity is, anytime we talk about velocity uh, in physics, in earth science, in any kind of physical science, this is the amount of distance in a given time. And for velocity of rivers, we're talking about water. So the distance that this water is traveling in a given amount of time. Things that have higher velocity that are moving faster are going to carry larger particles. They're going to be able to erode more. And the velocity is determined by the steepness of the slope, the amount of water traveling downstream, and the shape of its path. So steeper slopes like this one here are going to flow faster than compared to this one's. Uh, the amount of water, if it's just a little stream, it's not going to have as much uh, flowability. And the shape of it, if this is a more curving river like this one, it's going to have a slower velocity. If it's more straight, it's going to have a faster velocity. The gradient, this is the steepness of a slope. And so the gradient is going to change from wherever this river starts to wherever it ends. And usually, uh, our rivers are ending at a lower, kind of gentler gradient. So as we start out near here near the source, usually we're going very fast. This is a steeper gradient. It's going plunging down. It's getting some waterfalls. 
Uh, when it's traveling down the steep part, our gradient goes up. When we're down here, our gradient is down. There's less difference that it's, that it's uh, flowing over there. For discharge, this is the amount of, of in volume of water that's going past a certain point. Think of like gallons per minute, gallons per hour. Uh, kind of is, is one way to like measure discharge. It's not constant over the entire course of the river, and it's not constant year round. These things change all the time as we get more snow, more precipitation, more rainfall, or when we get snow melt, or when we get some precipitation that causes snow melt. We get more water in here, we get more discharge. This can cause, uh, like this picture here, these rivers to overflow their banks, and all of this liquid is getting deposited outside of this main channel, which is right here. And channel, the last part here, uh, is the path through which this water is flowing. So on this one here, this is a normal channel here. Under flood conditions, this water is escaping its channel. So the size and the shape of the channel, whether it's a wide river or a short, you know, or a very narrow river, is going to affect the velocity, is going to affect the amount of water that this river or stream is carrying, and therefore the amount of erosion and sediment that it is carrying as well. All right, so stream erosion and deposition. Uh, running water is the best uh, erosion agent. It's very good at eroding things. This gravity that's pulling on everything all the time causes this water to run downhill. As it goes, it picks up loose soil and rock and carries it along with it. Uh, as it carries this with it, oh, this does a great deal of erosion. And eventually, when the stream comes to a slower part or a lake or an ocean, uh, it loses its energy and it's going to drop these materials it's carrying. This process of dropping them is called deposition. Think of like depositing. So how do these streams actually weather material? How do we get these nice, smooth rocks? So any, any water that's flowing over bedrock is going to break this bedrock open as it continues to wedge itself down in there, flows through there. So we're getting a lot of mechanical weathering as we get the sand and pebbles that are carried in this water abrading this bedrock. Uh, it also erodes the cutting tools. And when I say cutting tools, I mean the things that are carried inside of it, the sand, the silt, the particles, the rocks, the boulders, depending on how big your river is. Those things that are getting carried in the river and are doing the erosion are also getting eroded themselves. They're clacking against each other. They're clacking against bedrock. Uh, they become these nice, smooth, round particles. All right, potholes. Uh, no, not the ones that you, you drive over. These are like these structures here on this picture, these like really deep gouges there. These cutting tools of the sand and the pebbles uh, get stuck in little whirlpools and they create these potholes, these deep oval or circular basins where this water is getting sucked in as a whirlpool, cuts them up really good. Over time, this will just all become uh, eroded. But in areas that have these, we get a lot of sand and pebbles and rocks that are swirling around and grinding these potholes into the bedrock. And you can see there's a whole bunch of small pebbles in this one that have been unable to escape as they've been stuck in this vortex in between high and low water. All right, plunge pools. This here is a plunge pool. This is a basin or a hole that has been worn away as this water is falling down this waterfall. Uh, this cutting tools in here are also carried down here as this is an extra little bit of energy. They're falling straight down. They're getting some speed. They're going to erode the bottom of this a lot before they start flowing down here again. So water does it normally, but adding in those cutting tools creates a lot more ability for erosion. Uh, a big part of these streams and rivers is transporting materials. These rocks and soils that get eroded usually will just get swept downstream and they'll get carried in what's called a river's load and there's three ways that we get things that are carried in load they're called carried in suspension they're carried in solution which means that they're dissolved or they're carried as the bed load and you see this, this traction over here and saltitation those are different ways that it is carried but they're either carried as large particles that are stuck on the bottom and kind of roll or jump they're suspended as like this is when you see like really muddy rivers these particles are not dissolved but they are also like not settling on the bottom they're suspended and then solution this is like salt water this is like carrying salt down 
Uh, if salt crystals were to get eroded and carried down the stream, it would be like this. And there are other things that get carried in solution that are dissolvable in water that get carried down in this manner. All right, and speaking of them, let's start them. So solution, this is things, minerals that are dissolved in water. Things like calcium, things like magnesium, things like bicarbonate are very common uh, ions to be carried in this solution. Ions, remember, are charged particles. Most of the water that's coming uh, in this stream that is coming from groundwater will keep any substances that have been dissolved inside of that groundwater with them. So if this is, you know, plants have leached this we've leached this um, nutrients from the soil it's made it into the groundwater this groundwater then makes it into a river it is going to carry those calcium magnesium and bicarbonate with it and take it away and down the river all right suspension so this water here is very clearly has a lot of mineral and suspension here we can tell that because it's brown if it was clear we would say a uh, solution but since it's actually like got some color to it this is suspension uh things that are included in the suspension are things like clay and silt and fine sand, these really small particles that are able to uh, float per se. They're not floating, but they're not, uh, they're moving fast enough that they're not settling. So even though they're heavier, this turbulence of this water here moving keeps them afloat. And the faster a stream, the more turbulence, the larger the particles it can carry in suspension. All right, bed load. So this is all the stuff on the bottom. Uh, sand pebbles boulders that are too heavy to be carried in suspension and what determines that is going to be up to the river faster rivers can carry uh heavier sand particles in suspension sometimes even small pebbles slower ones are not going to be able to carry any of these they're all going to be bed load so just depends on the river you're looking at but these objects are moved very slowly or sometimes they're only moved during floods especially our larger uh chunks in there so these boulders or pebbles can roll, they can slide, or they can do this saltatory or saltating motion where they jump and then they land and then they jump again. All right, so measuring how they transport their materials. There's two kind of things we worry about and they're closely related but different and there's competence and capacity. And competence is the maximum size that a stream can carry of particle and capacity is the total amount of sediment a stream can carry a stream can have a small competence but a large capacity it can still carry a lot of stuff even if the stuff it can carry aren't very big so both of these competence and capacity are affected by the velocity and the discharge more water flowing faster means you can carry more and you can carry larger and both of these numbers are going to change throughout the year usually as some you know as you get flooding this stream is going to have more water going to be flowing faster going to be carrying larger and more stuff all right deposition so when we lose our speed our velocity the, or we reduce the amount of discharge that this stream is going through uh, we have deposition that will happen so this happens as a river widens it can lose its velocity uh, if it comes into a curve where it has to change direction or it comes into like a rock outcropping where it has to go around it these are all areas that they can slow down but the largest decrease is when we reach a ocean or a lake we reach this much larger body of water this thing slows down because its banks are now really really wide compared to what they were and we drop all of the sediment we get some depositional features the the strongest and the kind of most prominent among them is the delta which it looks like this it is a fan shaped deposit that uh, forms when a river flows into a quiet or larger body of water. It's formed after the Greek symbol for Delta. And that looks like this. So the Greek symbol for Delta looks like this. This overall structure here kind of resembles a Delta and that's why it gets its name. This creates more room for this water to slow down. So you get more stuff deposited here. And then these little branches of water that are running through here, all of these are called distributaries. As it's distributing this water and material all the way around this structure. All right, river valleys. So rivers form valleys. Uh, they do this very slowly. 
It might start out as just a tiny little valley inside of some loose soil as this water is flowing its way down to like a larger stream or river. As this gets bigger, it turns into what we call a goalie. And those goalie, every time it rains, they're going to get bigger, they're going to get wider, they're going to get deeper as more and more sediment is carried down into this river here. When we get, uh, eventually, these will start to form, these goalies will start to move upward. So it'll start here and be carried down, and then it'll start here and be carried down. This is called headward erosion as we're moving backwards this way as the head of this is moving backwards. When these goalies get deep enough, they can reach down to the water table. We're going to talk about groundwater next well, next chapter, but they can reach down to the ground the water table and become a permanent river that is flowing year round or most of the year into this larger into this larger river. All right, canyons. Uh, streams and mountains and high plateaus, these small goalies are more likely to form recently. They're very small. They haven't had a lot of time to mature and get larger. As they rain more, they get more surface erosion, they get new streams and goalies. Eventually, we get to these rivers with these very big V-shaped canyons. Uh, these can We call them canyons, gorges, or chasms. This is where this water is flowing through the middle here over an extended period of time and continues to wear away this base here deeper and deeper and deeper. We don't get the we get these in areas of low rainfall because if you had a ton of rain all the time, it would bring the sides down with it, and it would be all kind of staying like this more. But we get the really really deep ones in areas where we have very little rainfall. Think like the Grand Canyon where it's not getting a lot of rainfall, so we get these very deep kind of structures. All right, our youthful or young river valleys. These ones are the ones that are more V-shaped. Uh, there's enough rain that they're getting some erosion but not a lot on the sides and this picture here is an example from the yellowstone river this is the little little big canyon of the yellowstone it's a very quote unquote young river comparatively to like the grand canyon so it's still got these very dis very distinct uh v-shaped valleys and remembering this v-shaped valleys is very important we're going to talk about the difference between v-shaped and u-shaped valleys coming up really quickly in glaciers Rivers are V. Just remember that. Rivers are V-shaped. All right, base level. So a stream or a river cannot erode its bed to a level lower than what it flows into. We call this level the base level. Uh, for streams, this is usually the lake that they flow into. But for streams and rivers that flow into the ocean, the base level is sea level. And sea level is the final base level. All water is trying to reach sea level. So it will continue to flow down until it reaches sea level. All right, let's talk about stream piracy. And this is not about uh, music, movies, or digital media. We're not streaming those. This is happening when we have one river eroding up into another one and stealing its water. So what will happen is we'll get this headward erosion as this small stream here continues to erode upward until it reaches this channel of the other river up here. And now it has a steeper path of least resistance to go down. And so this will just become one river. And this smaller stream here has pirated the water flow from this one. And these are really important as we get river systems that are growing and becoming larger and larger. Uh, the more streams that they pirate, the more water they're going to get. All right, rapids and waterfalls. So as water's flowing over these different types of bedrock, it flows over different types. Uh, different types of bedrock erode differently. We talked about the difference between Mohs hardness and that in, my ch in chapter five. Uh, so when we have this nice igneous rock that we're flowing over, there's not a lot of erosion on igneous rock. It's very hard. It's usually silica. It's usually quartz, feldspar, six or seven on the Mohs hardness. It's very hard to weather. If we have this nice hard igneous cap here and then we have let's say next to it a very soft sedimentary rock here this water is going to very easily erode through this sedimentary rock over time and create this waterfall as it continues to fall we get that plunge pool effect and it gets deeper and deeper 
and this waterfall goes lower and gets higher and higher and we get this nice waterfall formation as this waterfall continues to form as we continue to get this waterfall forming and getting this plunge pool uh, eventually we end up getting these overhanging kind of structures where this water is flowing over here and then down into this pool and when undermining happens this piece here is going to break off and when it does this new waterfall will carry that piece away and it will flow here and what will happen is this waterfall has moved albeit not very far but it is moving upstream and this is how like niagara falls formed this is it was undermined continually and continually until we get to the really big structure that niagara falls is today all right so floodplains and floods there's a lot of we're going to talk a lot about a lot about this the different structures that we see on floodplains and how they affect us they're very uh, important to human both agriculture and just lifestyle so a flood is anytime this water overflows its bank overflows its channel and the floodplain is this whole area where this water can be so some features uh, as the riverbed gets lower its gradient and velocity decrease these are usually slower rivers and these banks are eroded until what we call a floodplain at this point in time the river is very easy to divert it's not moving very fast so we get these winding features we get what's called meanders which are these broad curves that go back and forth on themselves as they're kind of meandering without a purpose across the floodplain and these happen because the erosion on the outside edge here is more than the erosion on the inside edge so it gets this nice wide part here it gets up enough speed and it erodes again gets up some speed so on and so forth all right oxbow lakes uh, this is a meander that got separated from the river so when we have these loops of these meanders eventually what happens is this water will break here and it will just start to flow like this it will just skip out this whole part out here and when it does when this meander gets cut off we call this an oxbow lake all right natural levees so as this water is going around these meanders like this it's carrying sediment in it as this sediment hits the edges here it's getting deposited as well in what we call natural levees especially when we get these uh, water overflowing then this these things are getting deposited as this water leaves its channel as it slows down so we get these very thick deposits built up and these very natural levees that are kind of keeping the water inside of these structures all right floods so floods are usually caused by heavy or long-lasting rain they're usually caused by the melting of snows or the both rain that melts snow flash floods are floods caused by one large rain they can be very dangerous they can uh, destroy property carry away cars we usually don't see them in large rivers usually only smaller streams uh, we usually only see them in this this way because usually large rivers have these natural levees they have these kind of build up these floodplain areas uh, these smaller ones don't they can get these really rapidly flowing very fast downhill uh, flash floods that occur all right dams so this is uh, a dam is any kind we have the river blocked what happens is this level that the dam is up to now causes the water behind it to fill up to that level this here is an ice jam which is a type of dam that forms when ice is breaking up during winter thaws and gets stuck on a on the structure here it's a bridge that this ice is getting stuck on this ice will continue to accumulate here with a lot of pressure built up behind it this ice gets very compact uh, volcanic eruptions as that lava flows over a river it creates a dam where now that water has to go higher than this lava to move on and landslides are also very commonly will, will cause dams we get dams in smaller streams from like beavers or like man-made activities uh, but most of the time when we're talking about dams we're talking about larger rivers all right so flood prevention and control as humans we've kind of like 
uh, decided that we don't like to have our fields flooded anymore. It used to be a very common agricultural process. We would let the fields flood in the spring. That would help plant, the, you know, help water the new plants. But we have some things now that we do to prevent these floods. And the first is replanting. Uh, we keep lots of, of you know, plant life. Uh, anytime we go in for it, do forestry, or we're cutting down trees, we're replanting to make sure that those trees are there. They absorb a lot of the water as it falls down. This reduces the amount of headwater that we get. It doesn't prevent floods, but it is a good kind of help controls that runoff, helps keep soil safe, uh, helps prevent you know soil erosion at that level. Uh, dams and these reservoirs that are man-made, man man-built, excuse me, uh, can store excess runoff. So they can fill up higher than normal and most dams have like an area where they are getting rid of water or allowing some water to come through. This allows them to regulate the level behind the dam. You don't want the dam to go all the way to the top and overflow. That would be very, uh, could cause them to break. Sometimes these dams can fill up with sediment, however, as these water, water passageways fill up slowly and get clogged up with sediment. So sometimes we have to go in there and clean that out before those dams can continue to function properly. We can use things like artificial artificial levees, where we're using sandbags. We use these a lot in emergency situations when we know there's going to be flooding. We know there's going to be a lot of uh, rainfall. We'll go and we'll stack sandbags in an area to create these little man-made water diversion. Water will go the path of least resistance, so it will go. If we wanted it to go this way, of course, we would like continue to sandbag up around here. And create this almost kind of this artificial levee here where this water is coming through and moving away. The problem with artificial levees is they create deeper rivers, which has more force. More water equals more force. So these also can break, uh, cause a whole bunch of damage when they do. And then we have spillways, which this picture here is an example of a spillway where we have a dam over here. And we have this channel that's running almost parallel to the river here that is used to divert water through here to kind of lessen the force that is building up here. So this relieves flooding, it slows down the water, it kind of splits it into two different channels, two different rivers, each river with half of the, the force of the other one. So this prevents you know, that water getting up to speed and you know, producing a lot of damage. Uh, that concludes uh, surface water. I hope you learned what surface water was, learned a lot about uh, river deposition and kind of structure and tributaries and headwaters and piracy. Uh, I hope you learned about these different types of flood control. And I'll see you in the next one where we talk about groundwater and uh, its effects.